that the role of the CIO has changed totally. You know, we were software developers and architects, and we could tell you what RAM to use based on its transactional speed. Do you think any of that matters anymore? The answer is no. Welcome to This Week in Health IT, where we discuss the news, information, and emerging thought with leaders from across the healthcare industry. My name is Bill Russell, recovering healthcare CIO, writer, and advisor with the previously mentioned Health Lyrics. I was the CIO for a 23,000 person health system, and one of the biggest challenges was to remain current on the technology and the trends that were going on myself. I think of um, artificial intelligence as a orchestra. Right now, machine learning, deep learning is getting a lot of attention, so I sort of equate that to the string section. And obviously, there are many sections to the orchestra, so someday soon, um, hospitals, healthcare organizations are going to be able to have amazing music. We are seeing instances of folks popping up, us included, where we're um, having a primary care position set up with a dentist in the same office. I would love to get to the space where eventually we're using voice recognition to do all of our navigation throughout the electronic health record. When uh, when we worked at Microsoft, oftentimes, you know, you'd have crazy deadlines. You know, people would say, look, we're not saving anyone's life here. We can't say that anymore. And, and we love that, you know, it's like we can, we can save someone's life. We can prevent a, a complication or a remission by catching it. A lot of the feedback people are hearing about uh, Vice President, former Vice President's uh, remarks is that he was remarkably pragmatic. And then the one that I'm most excited about, he notes that the Medicare Innovation Center, which was created by the Affordable Care Act, has the legal authority to experiment with new models to engage patients for purposes of getting better valued care. Hyper-consumerism, driving everything to a digital experience because if we don't make it easy for patients like ourselves to use healthcare on our smart devices, companies like Apple are starting to do it for us. I think we're, we're right on the cusp of a, a huge digital transformation. It'll be interesting to see how CIOs sort of address that. Welcome to This Week in Health IT, where we discuss the news, information, and emerging thought with leaders from across the healthcare industry. This is episode number 35. Today, we talk to the, to the geek doctor, Dr. John Holomka, CIO for Beth Israel Deakness, about the final rule for promoting interoperability, social determinants of health, and some pragmatic questions around health IT. This, uh, this podcast is brought to you by Health Lyrics. Health systems are moving to the cloud to gain agility, efficiency, and new capabilities. Work with a trusted partner that has been moving health systems to the cloud since 2010. Visit healthlyrics.com to schedule your free consultation. My name is Bill Russell, recovering healthcare CIO, writer, and advisor with the previously mentioned Health Lyrics. Uh, before I get to our guest, I want to make a quick note uh, so everyone is aware of the great resource for your IT teams. This Week in Health ID, IT has a YouTube channel, easy for me to say, with great insights from industry insiders short segments and complete episodes, all curated for easy access. Every week we add another seven short videos and the entire episode uh, over there. So right now we're at around 300 videos. Check it out today at thisweekinhealthit.com slash video and share it with your colleagues. So today's guest joins us uh, from the home of the first place Boston Red Sox, John Halamka, C CIO for Beth Israel Deaconess. Good morning, John, welcome to the show. Well, well uh, happy to be here. And remember, I am also a Red, Stock, a Red Sox a medical all-star. So, you know, I can send you pictures of me on the Fenway Big Board. Wow, that's pretty, uh, that's, that's pretty impressive. So you, it is amazing when you go from, uh, from ballpark to ballpark, how much healthcare advertises and is, is a part of the baseball program. So Beth Israel is, is pretty connected with the Red Sox. We are the official hospital of the Boston Red Sox. There you go. And the closest well, emergency department. So if you are hit by a foul ball, you come to see me. And, I, and I'll tell you what, I, I've been to a couple games this year. Um, those, those stands appear to be getting closer and closer to the field. I mean, it's, it's not uncommon, I would think, for, uh, for people to get hit by a foul ball these days. I do take my glove now because some of those foul balls are, uh, come screaming into the stands. Well, as you might imagine, we've done the analytics. And the analytics, this is actually true, looking at the cohort of those who visit Fenway Park over the last 10 years, 
what is the highest risk factor for traumatic injury? Answer, wearing a Yankees t-shirt. <laughs> True fact. That's, that's, not a, uh, that's not a surprise. I, um, I, you know, a short side note, I went to a playoff game at Dodger Stadium and, uh, and it was the Cardinals against the Dodgers. I'm a huge Cardinals fan. I wore my Cardinals jersey. Uh, we had to leave after the eighth inning uh, because we came back and scored, I think, six runs against Clayton Kershaw. And uh, people were saying things to me that I'm glad my kids were not around uh, to hear. And my buddy who I was there with looked at me and said, uh, we should probably leave now. And so we, le we left in the eighth inning uh, out, of, out of safety reasons. So that, that, is a, that is a legitimate health risk wearing the, uh, the rival's shirt to a baseball game. It is true. Uh, you know, the last time you were on, we didn't get to talk about this. But tell us a little bit about uh, Beth, Beth Israel Deaconess. You've been there a while. Uh, you know, what's, what's the footprint? Uh, what do you, what's your focus? What are you guys doing? Sure. So I have been at Beth Israel Deaconess since 1996 as an emergency physician and as an IT leader since 97. And over the course of time, people say, well, wait a minute. How could you stay in one organization for that many years? Well, think about it, back in 96, 97, machine learning was impossible. Um, IT was hard, stability, reliability, storage, networks, very challenging. So those first five years were all about building infrastructure, the predecessor to today's cloud. Um, and then, oh, security became an issue. And then years of security and keeping our systems and data integrity good. Oh, and then how do I think about apps? And how do I think about emerging services and integrating those and interoperability? So look at my career, four or five years long has been actually a totally different focus. So now what's next? Well, you can imagine healthcare gets better by getting bigger. So they say, it seems to be the trend throughout the country that mergers and acquisitions, community hospitals coming together with academics, independent physicians joining practice groups, that sort of thing. Well, in Boston, same thing's happening. So we have a $5.5 billion merger that is from Beth Israel Deaconess and Leahy Clinic, Mount Auburn, New England Baptist, all coming together. And that will pose a set of interesting interoperability challenges. How do I coordinate care across 7 million people and do so in 450 sites of care that are going to be running several different EHRs? And so it's more than just a few data elements for meaningful use. It's actually ensuring that you're getting quality and safe care at the right time, at the right cost, right. just fresh merged institutions. Right. So, uh, you know, just, just a quick side note and question on that. So are you going to have the same EHR across your acute care facilities at least, or is that not going to be the case? Well, so think about this, regardless of your brand loyalty, Epic, Cerner, Meditech, Athena, eClinical Works. When a merger and acquisition happens, day one, you're going to have heterogeneity, right? And so you can imagine Lady Clinic, Epic based. So it'll have a cloud of Epic. Um, my community hospitals, all Meditech based. So have a cloud of Meditech. Beth Israel Deaconess, self built. Cloud of Beth Israel Deaconess, self built. So you can look for the next couple of years, and you know that you're going to have to deal with not a hundred different EHR, but three, <laughs> and, and you know data sharing across those three. And then, sure, time will tell based on how the market evolves. Will that become two? Will it become one? It's a little early to know. Yeah, that's interesting. So the the I would love to just go into that for the next half hour, but but. Uh, but we're going to talk about some other things. So uh, can, actually, last time you were on, we talked, uh, you shared about the uh, Gates Foundation, the work you're doing in, uh, in Africa. It, it, can you give us an update on, on what's going on there? Sure. So the challenge in South Africa, 65 million people, 16% of the population is HIV positive. And the challenge of coordinating care across what is a very heterogeneous country, right? There's urban, there's rural. There are issues with infrastructure. Network bandwidth is expensive and slow. And identity management, who are you, is actually a challenging question because names are misspelled, workers move around. So with the Gates Foundation, we took the, the process of care delivery and broke it down into several what I'll call APIs 
or core functions. So core function one, who are you? So we'll do identity management and we'll do it based on biometrics. Because name, gender, date of birth match doesn't work so well, issue somebody identity cards, hard to know, but biometrics. If I say I'm gonna take you know, fingerprints, eye scan, you know, retinal or iris, um, palm vein geometry, or whatever is the biometric of the future, but build a system by which I can link your data by biometrics, that's an interesting infrastructure. So sort of API number one is a general biometric infrastructure. And we've deployed that in the right to care clinics and now can tag your HIV laboratory data to you. So you just walk into a right to care clinic and it says, ah, here are the last five viral loads that you've had showing your medication is working very well or not. Those are problem one. Problem two is how do I share the data with a patient? Right, as we'll talk about, I'm sure, there's this increasing trend in the US of patients getting access to their own data, their notes, et cetera. Well, hey, Bill, do you have an iPhone 10? Well, imagine that in South Africa, my lowest common denominator is the Nokia flip phone you had in 1997. Running on a GSM network, maybe. And so we've had to create a medical wallet for the patients that runs on a feature phone over very low bandwidth. And that's uh, something we've deployed. We did a lot of usability testing and keeping a, a good number of folks in South Africa on the team really helped us what the needs assessment was. And then the final question is, how do I deal with population health and data aggregation and look at variations in care quality and understand trends? So what we're working on currently is, is how do you expand what our early work on biometrics and this uh, medical wallet to something that's going to help for countrywide population health analytics. And that, of course, could be machine learning. And it could start in South Africa and scale to other countries. So what's the platform? So we're starting to think through that. Awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, just continuing to get updates on that. That sounds fascinating. And we talked a little bit the last time of why you know, those things uh, elude the United States health system for, you know, privacy and, and different political reasons and whatnot. Uh, and sometimes it's, you know, that the, the environment, the cultural environment and the political environment will give you the opportunity to do things in Africa that you couldn't do here and hopefully prove, prove the concept out, get the, uh, get the statistics and bring it back, bring some of it back into the States it will be interesting. Um, so on our show, we do two segments. We do uh, in the news. And where you're right. You know, and we have clearly. Did I lose you? Or are you still there? Did you have me? I'm yeah. still here. Oh, okay. Um, I'm sorry. You know, this, this uh, internet thing, sometimes it's not as reliable. We don't have uh, quality of service across this line. So, um, all right, so let's let, let's move on because we, we we do have a lot to talk about. So on our show, we do two segments. We do in the news, where we each pick a news story and discuss, and then we do sound bites, which is a series of about five questions that uh, I I, I want to pose to our guests. So you have picked the uh, probably the most important story of the week, uh, which is the uh, CMS finalizing promoting interoperability rule. So I'll let you kick it off with the uh, with the first story, and if you could summarize it for us, and, and we'll chat about it. Why is the operability program so important? So remember, as chair of the HIT Standards Committee, I was there as Meaningful Use Stage 1 and 2 rolled out. They were wonderful in that they built a floor for functionality, but they got a little cumbersome. And why did that happen? Because the Meaningful Use program with its stimulus and its penalties and its certification was so effective, it became a policy vehicle. And so I'll make this up. It's not exactly right. But if the FDA says, oh, we want to track medical devices, I know we'll put that in meaningful use. And the CDC says, oh, we want to track Ebola. Oh, we'll put that in meaningful use. And CMS says, oh, we want 20 new quality measures. We'll put that in meaningful use. So by the time we got to the end of stage two, it got to be very challenging to figure out what you're measuring, who does what, and how much time it would take for the doctor to even do it. So what promoting interoperability program says is let's scale back 
and think about just the few things we want to do really well, create some really clean measures, and let's offer partial credit. So, right, it's not on or off, black and white. If you as a hospital or doctor's office are making progress and your trajectory is good, that's fine. So what it says is, oh, let's pick e-prescribing and opioid, uh, what we'll call interventions to reduce the opioid crisis. And so that's sort of point one, it's e-prescribing, you know, electronic prescribing controlled substances, query the prescription drug monitoring program, verify your opioid treatment, and some are bonus and optional, and again, partial credit is okay. So that's sort of point one. Point two, referral management. Although we had in stage two the idea of I send a summary to you, there wasn't really the incorporation of that summary and it's closed loop referral. So you get referred to a cardiologist. You see the cardiologist, the cardiologist never tells your PCP at the plan. Well, how useful was that? So again, there's gonna be a bi-directional data exchange and incorporation, closing the loop, and partial credit for progress along the way. Providing patients access to their data, including notes, and do that via API. So anytime an app comes knocking, the data is sent to the patient. That's all good. And then public health, syndromic surveillance, immunizations, case reporting, public health registries, clinical trials, those sorts of things. So instead of saying there's a hundred measures and all these different complexities, it's four <laughs> with partial credit, a hundred points possible. If you get 50 out of those hundred points, no penalties. So this is really streamlining the program, focusing us all. So I think it's a very good approach. Yeah. So there's, uh, you know, it, we actually covered this in a previous episode when they uh, proposed it, but it's, uh, here's a handful of the things. So, um, uh, each our reporting period, minimum of, of continuous 90 day period, um, in, in the calendar year, 2019, 2020, 2015, uh, EHR cert is what's required rule finalizes, uh, new performance based scoring methodology, which you've, uh, discussed a little bit, which is meant to be less burdensome. CMS is finalizing, uh, two new e-prescribing e e measures really focused on op opioids, um, changes, uh, let's see. Oh, and the changes to the measures, which again, you've talked about, uh, removing a total of 18 measures and deduplicating 25, which is huge. Uh, and then the other one, which is interesting, require hospitals to post cost information on the internet uh, in a machine readable format. Clearly we're not covering everything. It's 2,600 pages. Uh, you, have you had a chance to read it yet? Of course, in detail. <laughs> and realize that 2,600 pages, like any of these regulations, 90% of it is preamble, right? So that's, you, you can actually get everything you need to know by going into the appendices and looking at the tables. Because uh, it's really justification for why they did what they did. Yeah, so it's interesting. This is interesting to me, but uh, let me ask you this question. So these things generally come out mid-cycle. Nobody has a financial calendar that ends in August and starts on September 1st. And uh, so this, this is hitting Beth Israel right now. This is the final rule. Um, give us an idea of what process you're going to go through uh, to generate the projects necessary to be compliant and to, uh, and to do the things you need to do to uh, move this forward at Beth Israel. And so here's the, the uh, Don Rucker at ONC recognizes this, and this is why they put in that 90 day 2019 requirement. So here's what it means. So here it is, September of 2018. But you don't have to have your certified EHR in place until October 1 of 2019 right? Because you have a 90 day evaluation. And as long as it's in by October 1, 2019, you can get your 90 days. So all, I mean, it turns out our fiscal year is October 1 to September 30th. So this hitting in August turned out to actually be good for us because I was then able to program all the interventions into the FY19 budget. And I actually don't execute on any of the stuff until FY20. So, so that for us was okay. So you can you can get ahead of it. You have gotten ahead of this, and and in reality, we're using the 2015 cert. Most EHRs are there. Of course, you have a homegrown one, so I guess there was some work for you to do. Yeah, and so we, of course, were the first EHR certified back in the meaningful use stage one days. 
and all the functionality for the 2015 cert already. We just haven't gone through the process. So that's fine. It's now in the FY19 budget as uh, the staff time necessary to take what is existent software and to go through the cert process, which we've done multiple times already. Yeah. So, um, so let's, let's talk about, you know, directionally uh, what they're doing here, what the ONC is doing here, what CMS is doing here. So, you know, you go from administration to administration. How much does the change in administration change the direction and focus of ONC, do you think? What's well, fascinating, isn't it, that you know, I've served Bush, I've served Obama, and you know, certainly stayed in touch with everybody who is on the, the current committee, the Federal Advisory Committee in the Trump administration. And there's a remarkable consistency. Uh, and that is, sure, politics change, but really, the trajectory of IT doesn't so much. <laughs> so a lot of the same people who were at ONC back in the Obama administration are still there, Steve Posnack, John White. So they are diligently moving us along a rather consistent program. And in fact, sort of the theme of the current administration is less regulation, less burden, all the rest. But the themes of what we're working on are fairly consistent. So I don't feel like there was a revolution here. It feels like an evolution. Yeah. I mean, the, the only thing I see that's a little slightly different in this is, uh, again, the, the bent being towards sort of free market. It's uh, we believe that access to information is is critical, not that interoperability is always about access to information. But this this whole thing of, hey, let's publish costs, I think is fascinating uh, because that's sort of a free market mindset. If we start publishing costs, there will be transparency into how much something uh, is 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 going to cost somebody and how good the doctor is or how good the system is. And I think that's one of the first steps for them in seeing this not as a universal healthcare program, but as a more of a free market program. We'll, we'll have to see how this plays out. Um, you know, the, the levers, the <laughs> levers of the government pools do not happen overnight. They, uh, they generally take many years to play out. So by the time this starts playing out, there's, probably a new administration and, and change. And that's one of the harder things to really, uh, for health system CIOs and health systems in general to sort of adapt to is the constant change in the regulatory environment. Uh, costs money and costs resources and time. I mean, how, uh, I mean, can you talk to that a little bit? How do you, how do you uh, prepare for that? How do you adjust for that? Sure, so governance is the key issue. So uh, I have, since you know, my earliest days as a CIO, had a guiding coalition of doctors and nurses and pharmacists and social workers and administrators who meet on a monthly basis to understand, well, what are the strategic imperatives, regulatory compliance imperatives? Um, what is it we need to do if there's a sentinel event for safety and quality? How do we be impactful? So I had the hard discussion with them in 2009. Think, I'm sorry, but for the next five years, all of our business imperatives are going to have to be put on hold because we have ICD-10, meaningful use, the HIPAA omnibus rule and the Affordable Care Act, and you must do them, right? No choice, right? Because otherwise we're all gonna go to prison. <laughs> and so the governance group said, uh, uh, you know, ICD-10 is not a very sexy project. Are you telling me we're going to codify flaming water skis, falling satellites, and chickens hitting you on the head? And I said, uh, yeah, <laughs> but must do. And so, the, but wait a minute, I have this pet project that is going to impact, you know, 25 doctors. Well, sorry. And the governance folks gave me the air cover to focus on ICD-10 and those things that weren't that exciting, but were must do's. But so then here we are in this era, as you described it we're out of that regulatory must do era and into a, oh, the private sector has to take a lead. You might have certain outcomes, you might have value-based purchasing or whatever, but how you do it, it's up to you. And my governance committee has now said, ah, well, fabulous, let's catch up on all the unmet needs of the meaningful use era. And oh, here are a couple of strategic things. Oh, and by the way, we'll make sure that what you do aligns with the future where we're paid with risk contracts, but we're gonna do it our own way, and that's okay. And as you point out, if five years from now, we get back to a, oh, 
story directed process, the committee will help me through that. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so let me let me take us to the next story. And, and uh, the genesis for this story, to be honest with you, is uh, I was looking at a conference that I'm getting ready to go to, and someone was going to speak, and they had this title, catchy title of why your zip code may be more important to your uh, to your health than your genetic code. And I thought, I remember that from somewhere. So I went to the all knowing Google and uh, sure enough, you know, there was a Harvard Business Review article. There was a, uh, uh, there was a, and, and there was a Huffington Post article. And that's the one I remember reading way back in the day. And it was circa 2009. And so I want to discuss that a little bit with you. Uh, you know, what's changed since 2009? I know it's, it's becoming an ever more hot topic. And, uh, you know, Boston's an epicenter for some of this. So let me, let me just summarize the article real quick. This is 2009 Huffington Post, why your zip code may be more important to your health than your genetic code. Uh, Robert Wood John Johnson Foundation uh, did a study and they looked at social determinants of health and they had a few facts. And here are some of the facts. Evidence suggests that medical care accounts for 10 to 15% of preventable early deaths. Some Americans will die 20 years earlier than others who live just a few miles away because of differences in education, income, race, ethnicity, and where and how they live. College graduates can expect to live five years longer than those who do not complete high school. Middle income people can expect to live shorter lives than higher income people, even if they are insured. And people who are poor are three times more likely to suffer physical limitations from chronic illness. In other words, as it relates to your health, our zip code is more important than your genetic code. So John, you live in Boston, it's fairly affluent. Uh, has its pockets, but it's fairly affluent, and uh, uh, you know, in a progressive city with a universal health care, uh, are the people of Boston healthier today than they were in 2009? Let, let's start there. Are the people in Boston healthier today than they were in 2009? It's a very complex question. <laughs> yeah. and so let, let me give you a preamble and then answer it directly. So you know I've been a vegan for 25 years. And so I eat nothing but plants, right? And so no, I don't eat eggs. No, I don't eat fish. Those aren't plants. Uh, and so what does that mean because I'm a vegan? Well, it means my cholesterol is 72, my blood pressure is 110 over 70, and my body mass index is 21. And everyone says, you're gonna live to 100, but why would you want to? Uh, but so of course, shouldn't it be rational that you should go to your insurance company and say, insurance company, I get a safe driving discount for getting no tickets. How about a safe eating discount for, for being vegan? And the insurance company says, um, that'd be no. <laughs> and in fact, what we need is people like you to fund all the people who are eating fast foods every day. So thanks. And, and so we haven't in this country had an alignment of incentives to change some of the lifestyle issues that you mentioned, and whether that's zip code or what you eat or how you act. But what's changing? And why do I actually think things are getting better in Boston? So not only, yes, we have this universal healthcare coverage so that there's a penalty if you don't have insurance, that's good. But what we're seeing is the move to value-based purchasing, the move to risk contracts with both upside and downside is so extensive in Boston that today, September 2018, 80% of the reimbursement of Beth Israel Deaconess Services is risk contract or value-based. So what does that imply? Well, that implies we better have an ACO that's looking at social determinants of health, right? If you are living alone and you don't have access to the right food, the right transportation, or an air conditioner, you're gonna be a high cost utilizer. So we actually need case managers and care navigators and visiting nurses to deliver care in your home to you that keeps you healthy because we are now at risk for your wellness. And so I spent seven million last year on just building out all the infrastructure necessary for that care management, care navigation, visiting home nurse service to keep people healthier in their homes. Incentives have changed, and therefore our business has changed. Yeah, that's fascinating. So risk, and, and that's really true in the, in the Orange County market as well. Uh, you know, Kaiser takes on the risk. And we heard this when I talked to uh, Mark Probst from Intermountain. They have picked a zip code where they are going to assume risk. And uh, Sharp Healthcare out of San Diego 
Uh, they have a significant amount of risk. And they, they act differently. I mean, they really do that assuming risk takes them away, completely away from fee-for-service. So then their, their economic incentives are different. Um, so let's look at this from two perspectives. One is, uh, you know, they're not in Boston, they're not in Massachusetts. How can healthcare organizations, um, you know, fund, uh, is, is getting risk contracts the only way to really fund being a part of social determinants outside of the altruistic nature of wanting a healthier community? Or are there other ways to fund really the, these, these social determinants projects? Yeah, and so again, a very complicated question. Um, so for example, um, I recently took a, a bunch of engineers from, a, from an industrial environment into my mix. And the industrial engineers said, wow, you know, we want to create products and services for consumers that will help consumers manage their own health. And so that I wanted to talk to a couple of patients. So they went over to this homeless gentleman and said, what is your favorite wearable? And he said, socks. <laughs> <laughs> and so we have to be a little careful because there are the consumer driven products that will help with social determinants of health, but the most needy of the, our, our, our patients are unlikely to probably buy and manage their own health well. And so that's where I think this idea of risk contracts, Medicaid ACOs are going to really help with that. Um, there may be models in the future where uh, can have economic health care and accelerate social determinants issues regardless of reimbursement to the provider. But for the moment, it does seem to be very dependent on the way a provider is reimbursed. Yeah, so CVS is in your backyard and their, their, their pitch, if I understand it correctly from the conference where I heard the gentleman speak, uh, is really to step into that care navigator, be that first point of contact, be that uh, uh, almost primary care physician, but helping them to navigate these complex health systems like yours. Um, are you partnering with them or where do you see them fitting and, and how, are, how are they going to mesh into the environment that you described? So we have no specific partnership with CVS, Caremark, Walgreens, et cetera, but we work very closely with all these organizations in our ecosystem because it, with a risk contract, as I say, you need to understand inpatient and outpatient and ED and urgent care and SNF and pharmacy and all these other kinds of options and make sure that they're, the patients are given the right treatment at the right time, in the right place, at the right cost. And, and so why do I think that what CVS care marker thinking is good. Well, so my, it's a quick story for you. Uh, some years ago, my wife was sitting at the, the uh, dining table with my father-in-law. My father-in-law began speaking in word salad. Re total nonsense. He had no issues with cognition or movement. It just, the words coming out of his mouth were random. And so what does she do? She calls me. I say, okay, he's having a stroke and broke his area. And it's expressive aphasia. And what we need to do is get him to a CT scanner at a local community hospital to see if he has a bleed. He doesn't need academic health care. He doesn't need a tertiary referral center. He just needs a CT scan. And so we go to the lowest cost of care CT scanner that's closest to our home and then do a telemedicine telecare connection to a neurologist expert who interprets that and delivers the right care at the right cost at the right time. And he did totally fine. Now, my wife called me. <laughs> That's not a very scalable model if every patient has to call the physician in the family. Well, can you, can you share your cell phone number so that we can try to scale it and see how it goes? Oh, perfect. Yeah. And, and so uh, the idea that there is this care navigator that directs you to the appropriate quality, complexity, and cost is really a needed function. And yes, you know, some of that will be human, but I also have to imagine over time, we'll develop machine learning models that'll help a little with that kind of thing. And remember, machine learning is not gonna replace doctors or anything. It's gonna augment care delivery so that everyone can practice at the top of their license. And so what do I mean by that? So here, let's use an example that you can't possibly see. But uh, so, so it turns out there's a spot right there. 
and that spot is brown and it's circular and it's flat. Is that skin cancer? It's been there for 20 years. It's homogeneous in every way. No, it's an age spot. Now it turns out, whether it's Google or Amazon or some startup, you know, you can actually take millions of dermatological photos and suddenly put a probability on a novel photo, whether it needs a consultation or not. And so that sort of thing suddenly will help our dermatologists get the right cases to review and the PCPs to know when to review and that kind of thing. So, so I just have to guess that CVS, Caremark and the like providing services augmented with guidelines, protocols and machine learning is a really good future approach. Yeah, and the, so the other question I wanted to ask you, I was with, uh, I was with somebody this week and we were talking about this and they're, they were, um, they were saying, you know, what doctor gives the most referrals in the, in the country? I'm like, well, it's impossible to answer. He said, well, not really. The, the doctor that gives the most referrals of anybody in the country is Google. It's Dr. Google. And, and, and we start talking about that. It's like, you know, people will type things into their search bar that they won't even tell their physician, that they won't even ask somebody else. And, and a lot of times, you know, Hey, my father or father-in-law is, is, is speaking, uh, you know, word salad. Um, their first inclination is going to be, all right, I'm going to, I'm just going to, Hey Siri, this is happening. What, what's going on? Um, so how do you think about that? Oops. I said, Hey Siri, and my phone went, um, but the, uh, how do you think about that as you're trying to develop the next round, knowing that in, in the Boston marketplace, in your marketplace, people are going to consult Google and what you want them to do is as quickly as possible get from Google to a, uh, a qualified care navigator or physician within your system. Right. So here, there's a couple of thoughts to that. And that is uh, our philosophy at this point is that the EHR is a fine transactional system for compliance and regulatory, getting the bills out and that kind of thing. But is the EHR going to provide the level of innovation that we need to solve the problem you just mentioned? Probably not. So what have we started to do? We started to create apps. Some are patient facing, some are provider facing. But example, turns out that we have 3000 doctors and you may know that I am the internationally recognized specialist on mushroom poisoning for every patient in the United States. Bizarre as that sounds, I do 900 consultations a year. At per chat, we in our app identify among our 3,000 doctors, sure, there's an orthopedist, but who's the guy who's the specialist on the right shoulder? You know, who is the person who knows more about mushrooms, whatever? So you go to the app, it's, this is the nature of my sign or symptom. And it's not a Google search. It is actually a curated, metadata-driven way of directing you to the right care. So again, everyone can practice at the top of their license. So we've written that. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I would just like to get, and I, I realize that that's an app way of doing it, but you know, you have this .health domain. It would be great if that becomes the curated uh, you know, content where I can go and do a search and I don't have to worry about how good is this content? Is it directing me in the right direction? How do we get that into more people's hands? Actually, I... We could probably talk about this a while. I think it's a fascinating problem. If people are going to Google, how do we, if they're going to Google or, or Bing or whatever they're going to, how do, we, um, how do we leverage that to better health across the board? Now, I understand that the homeless person isn't going to Google and there's other things around social determinants. I don't want to get mail from people around this. I, I get it that it's, social determinants is bigger than this. Um, but there is a significant portion of people that they're, the first thing they talk, turn to is the internet. And I think that's what the dot health domain was sort of geared towards is much higher quality data. Is that, is that your understanding as well? Yeah, it's early though, very early. And so what are we doing to your point? I think it's in, it is our responsibility to actually create Alexa apps so that you could be in your home and say, my father is speaking in word salad, what do I do? And so at the moment, we've created 30 different Alexa skills. 
and uh, everything from care planning, helping you understand when to take your medications, scheduling appointments, and those sorts of things. So I'm, I'm hopeful that where we can get to is a point where it's ambient listening in your home, supported by cloud-hosted decision support services, um, and it gets as easy as, you know, Alexa, ask BIDMC X, <laughs> and then you get, because we've registered the keyword BIDMC, the curated suggestion as how to navigate from there. Exactly. Well, great. Uh, all right. So we're going to uh, move into our next section, which is uh, the soundbite section. Here, I just, I toss out uh, five questions. And you're going to give, you know, one to three minute answers. If you go over, there's no buzzer, there's no whatever. Um, you know, we'll just, we'll, it's more of a, a guideline than a rule. We'll, we'll just go, go down that path. So, um, so I'm traveling. This is my East Coast office, if you will. Um, and uh, hitting some clients this week and next week. Uh, and I was in the room this week with uh, two senior leaders uh, on a healthcare IT team that came in from outside of healthcare. And it was fascinating, you know, very talented people from banking, from uh, manufacturing. It's interesting where these people are coming from. And they're being brought in because of their specific technology skills and, and uh, you know, new models that they're looking at and those kind of things. Uh, do you think this is a trend that's going to continue? And what, what do you think the hardest thing for these people to really grasp about healthcare in the transition to healthcare uh, is going to be when they come in from the outside? Sure, so I guess two thoughts to that is that if I were to ask, where do I want to partner with innovators? Is it retail? Is it banking and finance? The answer is it's actually consumer. And so look at what Google and Amazon and Apple and these sorts of folks are doing. They're creating tools and technologies that at a very large scale can empower a lot of interesting innovation. The challenge is, is those organizations don't have the healthcare domain expertise precisely. And so if they offer a cloud-hosted machine learning service, it's now my responsibility to make sure that it has the appropriate domain knowledge integrated into it when I create an application. So that's okay. You know, consumer companies go create the generic and then I will go create the vertical using that tool. Interesting. And that's what they're looking for when they partner with the health system. They're looking for that deep, uh, domain knowledge. They uh, and they recognize. I think now more than ever, when you talk to a Silicon Valley startup uh, or even one of these bigger players, they will say, "We need strong uh, health system partners, uh, partner with physicians, and, and have those conversations." They're yeah. Um, Great. So, uh, second question. This is more broader. So, healthcare an analytics. We're getting a lot of a uh, lot of conversations around this. And, you know, because it, it, it can veer off at this point, at this juncture in our history, it can veer off in a lot of different directions. It's still predictive versus, uh, you know, retrospective and those kind of things. But predictive is getting more interesting. And you're looking at machine learning, you're looking at AI and some other things. Um, so this might be another question that you answer with governance. But how have you structured your healthcare analytics practice um, to optimize it for success and and the, the changes that are likely to come here in the near future? Right. Well, of course, as you point out, it's all requirements driven, which is in order to be successful running an ACO, you need a set of benchmarking reports that are retrospective, that are looking at quality and cost and variation across different providers. However, what's, the trend is moving away from business intelligence and to machine learning and as you suggest, I am going to take a patient today and based on machine learning techniques of 2 million patients before them, suggest what their right course of treatment should be and start to schedule the interventions I'm going to make. You have to pick your use cases a little carefully there, right? This is not replacing doctors with machine learning. That's not it. But it's saying, aha, you need a surgery today. I actually look at 2 million patients like you and here's who should do it, how it should be done and how long it will take. And that's the kind of interesting, not so much business intelligence, because it's more complicated than that. I have to look at your age and your ethnicity and your comorbidities and model it in a predictive way using a machine learning approach. We've got about a dozen projects that our governance groups have suggested are appropriate use cases for that approach. So your analytics, 
your analytics projects are really bubbling up from all over the organization from a lot of different governance groups. There isn't a analytics group per se. Well, so in a $5.5 billion organization, you can imagine that you have a lot of stakeholders. So sometimes the stakeholders are the accountable care organization. That's one set of analytics. Sometimes it's the quality folks. Sometimes it's the compliance folks. So sure, all this ultimately bubbles into governance, but I believe in a you know, very federated approach, which is that I'll delegate to the ACO what analytics they need. I mean, I can't decide on their behalf. And hopefully I've built this generic infrastructure of normalized data that is accessible via a variety of tools and new machine learning capabilities that address these various stakeholder needs. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. And I, I, I think you probably know this, but there's so many different models out there around uh, analytics and how it bubbles up and how it's governed and where data governance resides. And uh, it's, it's really, it's one of those areas that's fascinating to me. And I, I, I'm going to keep diving into it on this show and, and see if I can not unearth the different models that are out there. Uh, third question, and this gets a little geeky, a little more technical, but where have you seen Agile and Scrum done effectively in health IT? So a challenge, of course, is that um, given every project that comes across the transom in IT, you got two or 300 different threads at any one time. It's really hard to do innovation when you've got two or 300 projects that are just keeping the lights on. <laughs> so where we've st started to use this sort of more agile approach is I'm gonna call it almost analogous to you know, the Google 20% work on something different than your job approach. So we've created a meritocracy where if you have proven yourself to be particularly skilled and resilient, we are going to give you the capacity to spend some amount of your time every week on a radical new breakthrough using an agile methodology with the notion that we'll do it fast and we'll fail fast. <laughs> So, so the thing that it was a bit of a caveat is when I see people doing innovation centers as skunk works, just separate from operations, it doesn't work so well because you can't get adoption. But when I take people on the inside of the operation, carve out some protected time, give them an agile methodology and have them move really fast, try things and fail, at least for us, that's worked. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, Fourth thing, uh, what, are, what are the qualities of a great CTO, so chief technology officer uh, within healthcare, do you think? What are you looking for? Yeah, so here's an interesting challenge. So I'm 56, young, young. <laughs> but what was the technology that I grew up with? Well, you're a journalist. It was called Smith Corona. Yeah. And I actually know what a carriage return is. Ding! <laughs> right? And so my problem is, as a 56-year-old, I am biased by 50 years of experience of technology that I had to build and sweat, and it was all hard. And so what I want a CTO to be is somebody who has more neural plasticity than me. When, when somebody approaches them and says, oh, there's this great way you can use Twitter, you know, I, w I might roll my eyes because I. It's uh, Twitter isn't necessarily the native technology I speak, but a CTO should say, well, I can actually, I can look at that objectively. And so it's that I don't come with not invented here syndrome. I don't come with too many biases. I'm willing to be a very objective evaluator of whatever comes across. So how many IBM Selectrics do you still have in your health system? Um, that I think there, I, you know, I can't count, but certainly it would be on the hundreds. Wow. It's, that's, yeah, that's amazing. Uh, but, but why, right? Forms. Try filling out a government form on a, on a printer. Yeah. You have to find one of those old Okie data dot matrix, um, yeah, with the special forms, uh, and quite frankly, a Selectric is just easier uh, for some people to use. Um, 
So la last question here. So uh, you maintain, uh, as people can tell, you maintain an extremely positive attitude. Uh, I'm sure you've had many difficult meetings, uh, as many as the, the next CIO. Uh, how do you keep from becoming cynical? How do you keep that, that positive uh, frame, of, frame of mind? So what's really important for an IT leader is to have something in your life that grounds you, right? So if I got customer emails this afternoon that said, I hate you, you're horrible, I'd go out and hug the llamas, right? So remember, I run a 70-acre organic farm that is a, the animal rescue for the entire Boston region. And so I have horses and cows and pigs, and I'm up at 4 a.m. shoveling manure. And if I have a bad day, I'm just out in the barn. Something that you can look to that is some part of a greater good keeps you grounded. Yeah, and the, uh, the animals aren't tweeting out uh, negative comments about you these days, I assume. Although they some... are writing anonymous editorials in the New York Times, though. It's, uh, you know, <laughs> those llamas, you got to watch them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're, they're crafty sitting over there uh, with those neural implants connected to the internet. Uh, anyway, <laughs> hey, John, thanks. It's always awesome to have you on the show. Uh, what's the best way for, uh, for people to follow you? Sure. So, of course, you know, I blog, though I'm doing a little less blogging these days because the attention span in general in the world is less. So Twitter, at Jay Holamka, and I'm also on Facebook. And of course, you can find out what's going on on the farm by looking at unityfarmsanctuary.org. Unityfarmsanctuary.org. Uh, great, fantastic. You, uh, you can follow me at The Patient CIO. You can follow the show at uh, This Week in HIT on Twitter as well. Uh, website, thisweekinhealthit.com. Uh, catch all the videos on the YouTube channel, which we talked about earlier. And, uh, and we will be uh, cutting this show down into three minute segments for our attention span. Uh, and actually, it's, it's, not a, it's not a joke. There's so much going on in IT. You just have to make it uh, consumable for people. And so that's what we're doing here. Uh, so thanks again, John. Uh, please, uh, you know, for our guests, please come back every Friday for more news information and commentary from industry influencers. That's all for now.